All right, hi everybody. Welcome to the virtual book launch for Pines North, Minnesota's Craft Beer Culture by Caitlin Regenshide. Caitlin is right over there. Caitlin, nice to see you. Welcome. Hi, thanks for hosting. Uh, I'm. It's my pleasure. Thanks for asking me to be here. Pines North, uh, published by the Minnesota Historical Society Press. Uh, this book just out, and we're also joined by uh, Doug Hoverson, who wrote the foreword to the book. Uh, Doug wrote Land of Amber Waters, The History of Brewing in Minnesota, and the drink that made Wisconsin famous, a beer and brewing in a badger state. Doug, thanks for being with us and being with Caitlin today. My pleasure. Congratulations, Caitlin. So we are, uh, we're just glad to have you guys here on the Minnesota Historical Society Facebook page. And we're gonna have a robust conversation tonight about Minnesota's craft brewing season, uh, scene about this season, this time that we're in right now. And I'm most interested really to get Caitlin's thoughts uh, about the people that make Minnesota's craft beer what it was, certainly from where it started, uh, gosh, I mean, obviously, Minnesota's craft beer scene uh, has been slowly developing over more than a hundred years. When you look at the craft brewery scene and what we have seen develop over the last ten years, it's somewhat astonishing to look back for somebody like now for Caitlin, uh, so young, so young. For Doug and I, we're like, I re we remember ten years ago when there were. Uh, Caitlin, how many how many craft breweries did you say there were one dec one decade ago? Um, well, not including brew pubs, there were just um, nine operating in the state. Yeah, and boy, when you didn't inc include the brew pubs, the town hall brewery folks and the you name the brewery, they came for you, didn't they? We were here before. It's a different and they, they had a huge role too, and that, that's super important. It just wasn't a, a huge focus of my book. And um, Doug actually addressed that in his book to the degree the brew pubs played in the craft beer scene that made the taproom boom possible. So they're very important and very well respected. And you know, places like Town Hall and Fickers also created a lot of the brewers that run or work at breweries and tap rooms that we love today. 100%. They also created the idea that you could have 10 or 12 things on a beer list at a time and people wouldn't think that was crazy. Yeah, right, right. And that at an early point was, I think, most of our, as a consumer, it was our idea of going to sort of a brewery, right? And Town Hall, of course, I think is very well known and respected for the quality, Pitkers as well, for the quality of their beer. Uh, but breweries, it's a different category, and there's no question we've seen an explosion here. Caitlin, before we get into kind of your story and how you ended up writing this book, uh, I feel like we should crack a beer. I mean, oh. we can't, you know, when you write a book, you have plans of having this wonderful book launch and a great party, and uh, this is wonderful, but, I mean, we have to do it separately. We're in the COVID era. And tell us what you've chosen for the first beer for us to crack. Um, I chose a beer from Bent Paddle, who I absolutely adore everything that they put out there and also their ethos as a company. Um, we're drinking their cold pressed black. Uh, one of the first beers that was recommended to me when I started visiting breweries for my blog. And I figured a little coffee is a good way to start this. Right, exactly. Well, you're, I think you're speaking my language, understanding that I've been up since uh, 2.30 this morning since I anchored the local news at, at WCCO, which starts at 4.30. So a little caffeine to, to propel me to the end of this is a is a heck of an idea, that's right. Uh, tell us your story, how Caitlin, I think, uh, you know, Doug has written extensively about Minnesota brewery scene. I have just, uh, you know, I've reported on it from the early days uh, for WCTO and also for Minnesota Monthly or Minneapolis St. Paul Magazine wherever I was working at the time. Uh, tell us kind of what, what led you down this road. Yeah, so I was um, interning at a social media marketing agency, which, hi, Tammy, I'm sure you're on here. Um, <laughs> and we started working with Forger Brewing in Rochester as a client. So working on logo design and social media prior to their opening. Um, and that really just made me fall in love 
with craft beer. And we had some other craft brewery clients as well as uh, beer distributors that had craft beer portfolios. So I just got to know the people in the beer scene. I mean, a few people at least, and really fell in love with their ethos, their perspective, um, this idea that work didn't have to be something you dreaded going to every day, but that you could quit your corporate job or live out this dream of opening your own brewery and making this product with your hands that you could share with people and that had a social element to it. Um, I, I fell in love with it so fast and eventually started writing a blog. And I went to every brewery in the state and my blog was called Beer and Life. So I drank beer and asked for life advice because what else do you do when you're fresh out of college and <laughs> don't go exactly where you're Right. Uh, so yeah, it's been a really fantastic journey. You now I work full time at a brewery and drink beer, get paid to drink beer. It's a great life. Was it the beer that drew you in or was it the people or the vibe or the energy or what was it? Um, I think that there was definitely an energy, a really specific energy to taproom culture. So mm -hmm. there's this generation of people, you know, before me who were really into craft beer before the craft beer boom. And a lot of that required being into home brewing or following regional brewers who distributed here. And I came into craft beer because of the taproom boom in Minnesota. So for me, that's inherently about the social element, the gathering, the space, um, why people go to breweries, what they experience when, when they're there. And the fact that you can sit down in a local brewery and have the mayor sitting at the bar stool next to you, chatting you up. I think yeah. there's, you know, there's nothing really like that. Yeah, it is. I, I, I'm glad to hear you say that because I feel like certainly the deeper you are in beer culture, people can get super nerdy about the beer itself. The same is true when I, I write about food. And people can get really like ingredient focused and origin of ingredients and this sort of stuff and cooking technique. And I think sometimes people lose track, people on the inside lose track of the fact that the average person, the experience that you're having at a tap room, much like at a restaurant, is much more about the cultural, social experience, which I think perhaps, and I wonder uh, for Doug's thoughts on this, when you look at some of the older brewers who've been around in Minnesota, maybe some of the founding brewers uh, of this uh, of this sort of rebirth, if you want to look at the last 10 to 15 years as this rebirth or, or regenesis of the craft brewing scene, it seems like they have a better handle on that aspect of things, understanding that the commercial side of this is, is somewhat uh, tapping into the social vibe of a tap room. Well, I think that's really true. And the ones that were there at the beginning of this boom also had to do a lot of breaking trail for a number of different things. Part of it was just explaining to people what a pale ale actually is and why this pale ale is five times darker than the beer they're usually drinking. And they got the idea that, you know, you could sit around and talk about the beer but you should also move on to the other things that talking about the beer should be a gateway to other conversations you have. Now, granted, at some point you're going to need to order another beer and then you could probably ask that person you just met sitting next to you, what do you like? But then you'll get back to other topics as well. And I think that was something that was very conscious. And as, you know, as Caitlin has said in the book and even earlier, it's a little harder to do it in a brew pub where you're sitting around a table waiting for your meal as opposed to one of those long tables that you often see in the tap rooms or even just standing mingling waiting for your beer at the counter hmm. caitlin how did you and doug come together it was absolute like the weirdest amount of fate doug sings in a church choir with a poet who visited my mom's sixth grade classroom <laughs> <laughs> and we're sticking with that story. Yeah. That's a very Minnesota story right there. Right? And, you know, there's not a lot of beer writers and especially published authors like Doug. So, of course, my mom dropped the information about my blog at the time. And we had connected a little bit. And I had been looking at turning it into a book or at least turning some of my experiences into a book. And Doug was nothing but gracious with sharing all of his knowledge with me. And that's something I really found 
in craft beer writing and just like the whole craft beer scene. There, there are some gatekeepers and people who will make fun of you for pronouncing some beer style wrong, but they're so few and far between and they're rarely the people that are working at breweries. Mm. It's more people that are excited to share knowledge, um, excited to educate, excited to learn something from you as well. Caitlin, I want to ask you because you started writing a blog at a time where women were not very uh, active voices in the craft beer scene. You certainly had food writers who were giving a, a fair amount of attention to the craft brewing scene, the Stephanie Marge, uh, Dara Moskowitz Grumdahl, Joy Summers, giving quite a bit of attention. I mean, I, in some ways, I'm like the token male in the food writing scene here in the Twin Cities. Because you look at Jess Fleming, also at the Pioneer Press. So many women kind of in the mainstream press. But when you look at the beer press that really was focused on beer, your blog, and you were one of the few women uh, as a voice. And we definitely today and in your book, you talk about gender issues, racial issues that we're seeing today. Uh, I just wonder what was, what was that like for you, not only as a woman, but you also were a young woman when you first got it started, essentially like, uh, right, you were in college while you started that blog, right? I, I had just graduated. Um, you know, it's at the very beginning of writing the blog, I, I had been a little ways into it and a woman at the Growler had reached out to me via Twitter, had seen my blog and, um, it, you know, invited me into that community. And then, um, I think it, like Jerry Fagerberg connected me with his editor at the city pages, Hannah sale, who's now I believe at star tribune. Um, and so people were kind of connecting me with other women or women were inviting me into the scene. And I think, you know, that's validating and also comfortable because there is a gender dynamic there and a power dynamic that could make things difficult. If I, you know, were really insecure about starting in, in beer writing or in, in any kind of journalism. And so there's definitely something to be said for having women in leadership and, you know, feminists has, have been saying that for, for how long? And yeah. I think- I just you, you mentioned, <laughs> you mentioned Jared who is in the in the chat here. He is watching today, so. Oh, hi, sorry, I'm on the, the not the public one because I'm too easily distracted. Right, yeah. Uh, no, yeah. Thanks, thanks for featuring me, Jerry. Um, but I think, you know, the easiest part of that whole process is I'm white and there's, when you walk into a brewery, so many of the people that you're gonna see in that space are white and blonde. And, you know, I have a lot of privileges going for me that make it easy for me to walk up to a bartender and ask for advice or people don't question me when I'm walking around taking pictures. And there's definitely some, you know, ease and comfort built into my identity. So yeah, being a woman writer has, is, one thing but i i have you know really just been mostly invited into the scene by other people and i'm hoping that you know in the next 10 years as minnesota craft beer begins to grow that expands to people who are different from me in other ways you know we do have some lgbtq representation in the craft beer industry but not a lot and we have you know very little bipoc representation in the industry uh which is just a fantastic opportunity for growth, right? Like if craft beer is about community and it's about bringing people together and representing the people in our state, we're only halfway there, which is exciting because I think so many people think craft beer is done growing, you know? We're, we're done with like opening 25 tap rooms in a year. Yeah. And that might be the case, but we're not done growing, you know, within the industry. Hmm. Boy, what a good point, because the reality is the growth here is, it's not in, uh, it, it maybe there still is growth. There are still communities in, in our area that are, uh, you know, uh, underrepresented when it comes to having their local craft brewery. I live in Maple Grove. We have one craft brewery, Omni, here in Maple Grove. And then just up the road in Champlain, another brewery just opened uh, in the middle of COVID. And you think like, huh. But look at Champlain, there's what, 40,000 people that live in Champlain. You're like, sure, why wouldn't they have a craft brewery? I mean, really, why wouldn't every, and Doug, as you've watched this go, and Caitlin will get into some of the breweries that you profiled in this, but Doug, I do wonder when you think about, and you've looked at Wisconsin as well, 
When you look at the geographic opportunity, Caitlin mentioned the opportunity to widen the net when it comes to, uh, you know, LGBTQ plus, when it comes to uh, various racial groups. And we've seen some of that starting to develop here, um, but slowly. Uh, there's opportunities there, but there are also opportunities geographically, right? Oh, definitely. And one of the things that's really interesting about the way the taproom culture has carried this movement is that it's really become the gathering place for people during the after work hours, the coffee shop of the evening, where you might not want coffee at eight, well, you do, but 7.30 or eight at night, but you might not mind a beer, a conversation, see some of the neighbor's cute dogs, and that kind of place still has a lot of opportunity to grow throughout the state. I think one of the neat things that we've seen in the last 10 years is there are now breweries in cities in the states that never had a brewery ever before, even in the biggest period of the pre-prohibition growth. So breweries in Halleck or Laverne or all over the far reaches of the state represent new growth and new people that can be brought into this love of craft beer. Yeah. And why not, right, Caitlin? I mean, my goodness, like we see this play out in coffee as well, where you look at craft coffee and you're like, why is it so white? Like black people love coffee. Latinos love coffee. Everybody loves coffee. Like why, why is it developed in this way? And sometimes it's just maybe no one's invited people to the table. No one's, uh, when you look around the room and you don't see people like you, you think maybe this isn't for me. And and it's the responsibility of the people who have the access. And uh, like you mentioned the gatekeepers, it's, it's their job, uh, our job to reach out and to say like, no, this is for everyone. I definitely agree with that. And I think, you know, that's something that I, you know, I have a lot of room to grow in, in terms of Who's, who's to say I can't go find all the cool new Instagram influencers and invite people in to the conversation that I'm having? That's, I think sometimes people feel like, well, who who am I to invite people in? I'm not the president of the club, but right. nobody's the president of the club. It's a, it's a really wide community. So yeah. you can be the president of your own club. Right, virtually. that's good, I really like that. I wanna talk about the book because uh, I, I uh, both Doug and I have read the book. I think that, as we enter kind of the gift giving season, I do think like if you've got a Minnesota craft beer lover out there, like this has got to be the Christmas gift for people because it's just a terrific look uh, from a big picture, uh, but you also take it down to the micro level into really teaching us and meeting some of the really cool people. That's what draws me to craft beer. I love beer. I love wine. I like all this stuff, but I mostly love people. And you're really drawn to their stories. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the history, because I know we have an image of a timeline that kind of lays out some of the history of brewing nationally in here in Minnesota. I wonder if you could quickly take us through some of this, Caitlin. Yeah. So um, I'll, I'm going to look down at my book because the timeline's a little small on my computer. But um, so Doug's book really digs into the deeper history of Minnesota's beer past. Um, but I pick it up right around homebrewing becoming legalized um, because that's the the hobby that built the interest and even the fanaticism around craft beer that I think set the stage for the taproom boom to happen. Um, and if you are at all interested in learning a little bit more about that, I have a book behind me, The Craft Beer Revolution by Steve Hindi, that really digs into that. So when homebrewing got legalized in Minnesota, just shortly after it was federally legalized, that's when things started to explode. And it, it was around 1987 that brew pubs were allowed to operate. And I know Doug has told me that that date's a little hard to pin down. It's <laughs> difficult to dig through the, um, the legal history of all of that. And it really took a while after that for craft beer to start taking off. So it wasn't until 2003 that Minnesota brew pubs could start selling growlers. And let me tell you, growlers have been a point of legal contention. So this whole timeline is revolving around when Minnesota starts taking back or adding to the legality of craft beer. 
Um, so then there are caps added to and changed for the amount of barrels a brewery can produce per year if they would like to sell growlers. It doesn't matter how many growlers you sell, just how much beer you produce. Um, and then a little bit later on, it's Minneapolis signs off on growler sales for breweries. And that was quite a few years after um, it was actually allowed for at, allowed for breweries to sell uh, growlers at the state level, but each municipality had to sign off on it and it took Minneapolis a long time to get there. But after they did that, um, Harriet Brewing was able to open up. And that is kind of like the the godfather of a lot of brewers or people that are working in the industry now. They got their start at Harriet selling growlers or cleaning mm -hmm. growlers. Um, and then when the taproom bill passed in 2011, um, a lot of people call it the Surly bill because of the heavy role that Surly's team and their fans had in um, getting that bill passed. So that bill passed in 2011, and that's when the taproom boom really exploded because when a brewery was able to operate with a taproom, it really opened up revenue for them. So being able to sell beer directly to a consumer on site is a fantastic marketing opportunity. It's a higher margin for their income as compared to canning where you're spending what like 10 cents on a can and a few cents on a label plus giving a cut to the distributor that taproom really made it financially viable for so many people to open up their own breweries and a lot of fun right a hundred percent like it is doug you kind of mentioned the coffee shop uh corollary and i do think sometimes like people get a little too obsessed with uh, and this sounds stupid, right? Like quality matters. Like I care about quality. When I go to the liquor store and I decide like, all right, what can of beer or what bottle of beer am I going to buy? Like I care about quality and consistency and all of those things. But when I'm going to a tap room, like maybe I care about like what food truck is outside or what games they have in there or is it kid friendly? Can I bring my kids to it? You know? Those, I, that was something I cared about when they were younger. Now that I have 13 and 15 year olds, like I do not want to bring my kids to a tap room. They're like, this is, it's too close, too close. But you care about different things, right? And I think you have found, as you've profiled 16 different craft breweries in the book, uh, people get that. Like the founders of these uh, breweries, they definitely understand the value of the vibe. Definitely. There's, um, I feature a couple of designers and builders as well uh, who talk about their strategy in building a brewery and um, furnishing a brewery as compared to a restaurant or. Share, share, a, couple of, share a couple of those stories, Caitlin, some of those places that really stu uh, stood out for you. And we'll get, we also are following your comments here in the Facebook chat. So if you have questions and things like that, we're definitely going to be doing that over the next 40 minutes of the chat. Go ahead, Kayla. Um, yeah, so I talked to a couple of the people who worked specifically on the prize tap room as well as other tap rooms, but that was how I how I knew who they were because I had um, written a feature about prize when they opened and all of the you know the intentional small factors that went into the space as well as you know the very large ones. Um, for example, prize has feather bowling in their tap room, so that's a huge feature that's very visual. Um, and something that they had to design around. So, you know, something that Doug has talked about earlier, sitting around a table with your food, the the shape of restaurant tables, you're maybe not that close to other people. And because their revenue models are built on, you get your food and then you leave and you're turning tables as compared to a tap room where you're just drinking beer probably. Um, and you can stay and have a few more and the amount of time you stay is it based on how long it takes you to finish a meal. Tap rooms are gonna have more standing room or they're going to have more, you know, the German beer hall style tables with the really long benches and you're, it's a little bit more of a community. Um, with being all beer and no cocktails, the bars are gonna be shaped differently. Um, for at brew pubs where they can have cocktails, that's when they start to take on more of that restaurant vibe. Um, whereas if you look at the places that have Food, but no cocktails at all, you almost wouldn't be able to tell the difference in their tap room if you're looking at like Urban Growler, for example, uh, or Prize, which has uh, rotating restaurants and food trucks coming into their space. Uh, so a lot of those little design features are just built around the social aspect and the staying and having another. Yeah. Yeah, Doug, have you noticed, I mean, is it similar? You've also looked at Wisconsin's 
uh, culture for one of your books. Is it similar, you think, the way that things go, the, the way things have progressed here compared to what, what we see across the border? I think there's definitely some similarities and there are some of the same architectural features that Caitlin described. I think that Wisconsin has a much deeper tavern culture though, because yeah. they have you know, decades, centuries of traditions of the tavern just outside the city fire limits on the intersection of Highway 23 and County Road X or something like that. And there's that idea that you're going to be going to the tavern and there will be a Packers game on. And yeah. if you go to the tap room, there might not be a TV. You may have to, or better yet, get to talk to somebody <laughs> about not football. Right. You know, heresy. It, but. it is a good point. Like I am, I lived in Milwaukee for a while. I went to Marquette University in Milwaukee also. And it is a little astonishing that Milwaukee as a state that's known for Wisconsin as a state that's known for beer because of Miller and, and also lining Google. Um, I, I feel like the craft beer culture here in Minnesota, it's not even, it's not even close. It's so different. It's so, there's so much more of it and much higher quality here. And I do think it's uh, a lot of that has to do with the tavern culture. Like you said, Doug, the fact that people in Wisconsin go to their bar and people in Minnesota right now go to their tap room. Yeah. And I think, Another way where Minnesota was a couple of years ahead of Wisconsin was in going for sour beer programs, a little bit more with barrel aged programs, though there are certainly wonderful examples of both over there in the Badger State now. But I think Wisconsin really hung on to its lager. It wasn't as much of an IPA state for quite a while. And again, there's great IPAs being brewed over there. Yeah. But, you know, it, Minnesota, palettes were just, I think, a little bit more aggressive. Yeah, for sure. The early craft beer adopters, right, Caitlin? Like when you look at styles and think about what really pushed this, uh, uh, I'm curious for your thoughts on this, because we definitely, I mean, IPA is still the king. I've been interested over the last mm, two years. We've seen kind of a swing back maybe to a, a minor degree you know, the brewers want to talk about it, how they're making these, you know, crisp pilsners and this sort of stuff. But I think the people are still drinking IPAs. Uh, how much do you think the style of beer has played a role in kind of this progression over time? That's a good question because I think it, it really starts with home brewing and with people wanting to try or taste beers again, like the ones that they had when they went to Europe and went on a craft beer tour at the mm -hmm. monasteries or people who had a porter and they couldn't find something like that um, at their local liquor store necessarily, or not, maybe not something reasonably priced or definitely not anything local. Um, and I think there was a, a really big boom associated with that. But then like nowadays you have people that are getting introduced to craft beer and They'll say, well, I don't want anything hoppy. And it's, well, is it that you don't want anything hoppy or that you don't want anything bitter? Because let me tell you about milkshake IPAs, right? There's, um, you know, like this whole expansion of what is hoppy that is introducing more and more people into the scene. Um, and in terms of like aggressive flavors, I do think that there's more of a market for people who like their beer to have like that stronger flavor profile, just like we do with coffee or with wine, as opposed to like a boat beer that you're, uh, or like a keg party that you've had. Uh, you know, there's a really big difference in, in the flavor intensity and the flavor profile of that, and also in the alcohol content as well. And there's, there's something to that where craft beer is built to be a little bit more of a slow sipper because you're not going to be able to drink double IPAs the way that you did keg stands in college. Um, yeah. So the beers are going to be a little bit different, and um, yeah. that's Doug has no idea. Doug has no idea what you're talking about. Keg stands in college. <laughs> Come on, Doug. We know the truth. 
Uh, let's talk about some of the breweries that you profile. Why don't we start with Ben Paddle, since that's what we opened first. Uh, ben Paddle is kind of a, uh, I mean, a fairly, it, I think a lot of people forget how new it is, considering how large and established it is. Why don't you talk a little bit about the two couples who founded uh, Ben Paddle in Duluth? Yes. Um, so Bent Paddle um, is founded by, like you said, two couples. They're 50% woman owned, which is really fantastic. Um, they, when I interviewed Laura for the book, she talked about how they wanted to be the summit of Duluth. So you're, you know, you can go anywhere and find a summit EPA. It's like the standard Minnesota craft beer. And she wanted to create that for themselves up in Duluth. And they were actually planning to open the brewery prior to the taproom bill passing. So when it passed, they had to quick pivot and retrofit into their space, a small tap room, mm -hmm. uh, which was really fantastic as it was. But then a couple of years ago, they were able to open a tap room into the building next door to them. Now, with Minnesota laws, the beer you serve in your tap room has to be served or has to be brewed in a space adjacent to the tap room. So their production facility across the street is what we're drinking now. And then they actually had to build another brew house into their tap room <laughs> just so that they could still serve beer in their tap room. And it is fantastically beautiful if you haven't been to the new space. Obviously, we can't go there for another few weeks, but um, I know they had a really fantastic patio set up all summer that was really COVID safe. So hopefully <laughs> next summer we'll all be able to go up there again. But uh, They've only been open for like for five years, right? In that renovated space, it's, it's fairly new, yeah? Yes, yeah, the renovated space is fairly new and it is just absolutely gorgeous. The design intentionality that went into it is really fun and especially to see a space that was built by people who weren't, you know, using every last penny from their bank loans to get opened. They, you know, they've been making money for a few years, so they were able to really like build into this space all the beauty that is possible in a craft beer tap room. So like tile work and artwork and custom canoe paddles and a chandelier made out of the pack tech carriers, little plastic carriers that go on top of your cans. Um, so the, yeah, those four have really done a fantastic job out there. And I think that they have kind of become that summit of Duluth, at least to a certain degree, they've, uh, everybody kind of knows their name and has had at least one of their beers. And it's definitely a go-to stop on your way up to the North shore. Doug, don't you think like when you, to, to me anyway, when I look at quality beer and consistent beer, I think Ben Paddle is for sure top tier in Minnesota. They're definitely up there. I mean, you could put other people in that list, but you can't kick Ben Paddle out of that list. And it might just be because I've known Brian since he was before he was even at rock bottom. And, you know, I go way back with several of them. So you know, personalities get involved here, but I think they're one of the ones who's done a phenomenal job of having a lineup of flagship beers where you can get a phenomenal Pilsner that tastes exactly like what a Pilsner is supposed to taste like. Their IPAs are great, but then they've got all of their bomber bottle specialties, the double cold press barrel aged wow. spectacular stuff that you just want to have in front of a nice warm fire. Yeah. Yeah. And I do love how linked they are with Duluth because I really believe part of the appeal to craft beer and part of what we've seen that has really changed in this state is, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, you could go to a good beer restaurant and you get a sample of the coolest breweries from all over America. Well, Minnesotans have decided that what they want to drink when they go to a beer bar is the coolest selection of beers around Minnesota. And uh, Ben Paddle, I just love, you know, you look at this coffee beer, which we've been drinking, this cold pressed black with the with a Duluth Coffee Company, which is a terrific coffee roaster. That's a hell of a beer. It's really delicious. Caitlin, you did good. You picked out a great one. <laughs> <laughs> we have a few more to work through, so drink okay. up. Forget about that. Well, you did mention that they wanted to be the summit of Duluth, yeah. which I think brings us nicely into Summit, uh, because Mark Stuttrud, I think, uh, is at uh, once an absolute uh, pioneer in this industry and one of the most fascinating characters that you'll ever meet here in the Twin Cities. Did you find that to be true, Caitlin? I think character is a fantastic 
word to describe Mark. He is, he has so much personality and is really candid in talking about the beer industry and, you know, what he's done to get where he is. I mean, they're just a titan of, of craft beer in Minnesota. And he's listed as, you know, one of the pioneers in craft beer in the whole country as well. Um, so Mark is really willing to explain what it was like when nobody else was on the scene, right? He was there. He walked uphill to school both ways. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, what they've built at Summit is just fantastic. They have so much, you know, like the quality assurance team that they have, the labs that they're working with. Um, I think it's really impressive. And that also that he was a little slow to adopting the the tap room necessarily. Um, they have a rat sculler now, which is tied to the original German term. And I'm sure Doug loves that. <laughs> uh, oh. And yeah, and their space is, has been newly revamped since they first opened it. And he has always just been focused on the beer. So that slower adoption to the social aspect of craft beer, um, I think just says a lot about their dedication to getting the business right and getting the beer right. And Summit is so big on, you know, supporting your local pub as well, because that's the model that they built themselves on. You have breweries now who built themselves on a taproom model and just getting people to come to them. Summit, it's it's all in their name. It's all in what they look like everywhere else. That's where they're, you know, seeing most of their revenue and that's where their brand exists is out in pubs. So kind of like, you know, Wisconsin's tavern culture. I think they're still a lot to that, being able to walk into any snowmobile bar anywhere in Minnesota and odds are I'll find a summit EPA on tap. Yeah. He opened in 1986 and everyone thought like he was crazy, but you definitely see, uh, I think the rip on summit is that it's become like, it's your dad's beer. It's your mm -hmm. grandpa's beer. Um, which I think is very unfair because the well, because I'm a dad, I think that must be why. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but their quality is incredible, and so many of their brewers have gone on. You know, you look at the, you know, the quality of the team that they have over there. But I do understand when you're number one in terms of production that people say like, "Well, I've had some at EPA. I've been drinking it for ten years." I want something different. They may, do you think they have a marketing problem or do you think they have, uh, I, I, I don't know. I wonder what you think about that, Kate. I mean, they're the biggest craft brewery in the state. You tell me if they have a marketing problem. <laughs> no, they're doing okay. Yeah. They're just not cool. Maybe that's um, fine. You know, I would say that maybe being seen as your dad's beer is a marketing problem, but also to have consistency from batch to batch for so long is far from a problem and also you know they're not having beers explode on shelves and right. they're not having you know a lot of the problems that smaller craft breweries are facing or they're not sending out stuff that's just not up to par that's part of their brand and you know maybe the trendy stuff will prevail but i think that there's in, there's always a market for some of EPA. I'm not going to be drinking a lactose extra fruited IPA 8% on the boat. I'm going to get a 12 pack of summit and well, I'm not going to drink all 12 of them because that would be a bad idea on a boat. But, but I, you know, I think there's, there's a lot to be said for that quality and that consistency. And it's kind of like being called the, the group mom. Sure. It's, it means you might not be like, the most popular kid at the party, but it also means everybody trusts you and turns yeah. to you. So there's two sides to every coin. Yeah. I also think that, you know, in all of the quest for the next bright, shiny object, Summit has definitely brought out some of these beers. They've brought out a different range of IPAs and they've brought out their sampler seasonal pack the penalty box in particular has always got some good stuff in it, but I think they want to make sure they get it right. And, you know, there, this happens with a lot of businesses that are established, but what they need to wait for, which won't take long is to be somebody's grandfather's beer because all the kids want to drink the same thing their grandfather did because now they can get close to grandpa and they didn't want to play catch with them back in the day and drinking grandpa's beer is the way they can do that. Yeah. 
definitely. I mean, PBR is, you know, popular as, as a hipster beer. So it's just a couple more years till they become vintage. <laughs> that's, that's probably true. I love uh, something. I think it's very careful with that because that makes me vintage then. Right. You're <laughs> super vintage, Doug. I'm knocking on the door of vintage. Let's put it that way. Uh, we do want to leave time for questions from you guys here in the Facebook chat. And we are getting some good questions. I don't know if we can put, do, do we have a question that we can put up on the screen? Yeah, let's do this. Oh, Bill Kane, you asked, you asked the, the explosive question. Let's start right with this one. <sighs> what is oh. your favorite brewery and why? So cruel that they chose this. Uh, but can you can you answer, maybe can you give us three favorite breweries? <laughs> Caitlin, you want to go first? Yes, <laughs> that's, that's good, Jason. I, li I like the little wiggle room there. I mean, I definitely have to give a shout out to Forager because that was, you know, one of my first ways of being exposed to craft beer. And Forager has also really made themselves a name in the craft beer geek world, right? People will drive down to Rochester. They will spend a lot of money on Crowlers for Forager beer. And Austin's doing some really fantastic stuff with um, all of his knowledge of literally foraging and then also... Um, you know, food pairing. And he has so much background in all of that world that he's able to make beer that's not just going to be like a one hit wonder, but is actually going to be really fantastic to share at your dinner party. And then also Annie is um, the owner at Forager and has done a really amazing job just building that whole business out there. Food is amazing. It's so uh, good. It's really so good. good. So yeah. good. And, you know, I've seen a little bit of Forager in the folks in Portage up in uh, Walker, Minnesota on Leech Lake. Uh, pretty small outfit. They're featured in the book. Um, and they actually had, had burned down and rebuilt. So you might recognize their story from that. But just like Forager, they're, you know, doing like these smaller batches, going out and foraging for yeast and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. I was drinking uh, one of their all organic beers earlier. Um, taking a little inspiration from Bang, who's featured in the book that does all organic beers as well. And their their tap room is just beautiful. It's like going to your cabin. Yeah. Um, and I've, huh? I've got to say Bent Paddle is just so consistently good. I could order a flight of every single beer on their menu. And even if it's not my favorite style, I'll still love it. Um, and their space is beautiful. I love how they've partnered with local restaurants. I love their focus on sustainability. So, you know, just like I said earlier, it's not just about the beer for me. It's also about the whole taproom experience. Good. All right. You did good. You, you stood up for greater Minnesota, Caitlin. All the Metro people are going to be all upset. I'm here for it. Well, you know, I, I cut my teeth doing road trips to go out to visit breweries for my blog. So I'm no one to, I'm not one to shy away from driving out for a good beer. Yeah. Excellent. Doug, want to want to throw out a couple favorites? Oh, sure. Now's my opportunity to tick off 185 <laughs> other breweries. <laughs> that is a shocking stat. Ten years ago, we had nine breweries, and today we have close to 200 in the, in the state of Minnesota. That's amazing. Well, I remember when my, my Minnesota book first came out, and one of the local food writers and I had a tasting where she and I got pretty much every beer we could find by a Minnesota brewery in the store. And it was only about 40. Now that right. was a fun afternoon. <laughs> um, but um, I would have to mix it up too. One of the ones I'd like to throw some special love to is Bang over in St. Paul because they make great beer, especially considering the limitations of trying to find organic ingredients for everything. I Love their outdoor beer garden with all of the native plantings. It's wonderful. Um, I, I'd also like to give a little bit of a shout out to a couple of outstate ones as well. Excuse me, Greater Minnesota. Um, every time I've been up to Junkyard up in Moorhead, I've had a great time. They have an amazing range of beers, but just being able to sit outside there under the lights and have a conversation with people about the beer and about the area and, and all of those things has just been great. Um, one that I finally got down to this winter just before COVID closed in on us was Brow Brothers in Marshall. Oh, and yeah. I had been to their original place in Lucan, which was tiny. 
and the sprawling expanse they have in Marshall gives them an opportunity to have a driving range and all sorts of games and you know phenomenal beer and food in a family business that has staked out its corner of the turf down there in southwestern Minnesota and just really become a landmark. Very good. All right, good. Thanks, guys. Let's do our next question from Leah. What surprised you most about craft brewery culture? Hi, Leah. Um, I think what surprised me most was how chill everybody is in person because like craft beer, especially dudes online are not chill. No, um, they are not. Think, yes, and p if you know, you know, and if you don't, I will let you find out for yourself. Or, glad you know. or, or not. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so I think it, it's just, you're really welcome to ask anyone a question and the number of times it's been, oh, let me go get the owner and have them come talk to you. It's, I mean, it's one of those things that you're really only going to come across at like these small businesses at a local business where the owner really is just sitting across the bar from you. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think that's something that I wasn't expecting people to be so nice. Hmm. Yeah. They're really nice, aren't they, Caitlin? I mean, most of the people who are opening uh, craft breweries are crazy. Like, they're crazy people because this is not, like, it's not generally going to be lucrative, right? Like, it's mostly uh, an absolute lark of a passion project uh, because the economics of this are challenging. They just are. It's why the craft breweries are freaking out right now with everything closed and they want to sell cans or smaller amounts of beer. And it's because their business model is essentially that of a coffee shop where their business model is helped by beer that's sold at liquor stores. But most of them make their money by selling beer that costs them 30 cents to produce for four or five, six bucks in their tap room, right? Definitely, yeah. And there, there is a push right now to at least temporarily expand vessel sizes because right now the smallest um, size a brewery can sell their beer in to go is 750 milliliters. So a crowler, about um, 25 ounces. Okay. And that's perhaps not going to be quite as feasible. If you already have a canning line and you are sitting on stock of cans, you're able to produce a lot more filled cans per minute than you are filled crawlers. Yeah. Uh, there, there's a push right now, at least temporarily in, in the middle of COVID, to allow for that expansion of vessel sizes. And that's something that's been attempted in the past and and has not made it through legislation. But Liquor stores don't like it. Municipal liquor stores especially. And much of it, if you live in the Twin Cities, you don't really... Uh, you're not as plugged into this culture, but around the state, there are many municipal liquor stores uh, run by cities, and, and they have a fair amount of power in the legislature. Should we get the next question? Let's fire it up. Uh, Bailey says hi. Uh, oh, great question. What differences do you notice between craft beer cultures in rural versus urban areas? Hi, Bailey. Um, the culture is... To a certain degree, it's the same, and there are also some differences. So, you know, you're always going to have people who are there because they, you know, they love craft beer, and maybe they're traveling to visit the place. And, you know, odds are you're going to have an owner who started this brewery because it was a pipe dream. Um, you're going to have regulars at both places. But I think a big thing about going out to um, more rural areas or even just getting inside of the metro area, you're going to see breweries where people are having a lot more conversations in there. I think in like in the Twin Cities, like I work at a downtown Minneapolis brewery. So you have people that are going there who are pre-gaming, who are going to bachelor parties. But, you know, you also have the folks that live in the neighborhood that come because it's in walking distance and they'll take their first dates there and come do their board game nights there. Um, and I think in, in the rural areas, you just have a lot more of that. It's a lot more community family type minded as compared to a place where you have one too many or you have to get cut off um, but in terms of like the ownership or the ethos of the places it's it's really consistent because it's just 
people, you know, congregating around their love of a product or of a work style of, you know, of doing something with their hands. Yeah. Feel the same, Doug? Yeah, I was actually surprised at how little difference there was. And I kept discovering that place to place. I, I was thinking about just about a year ago that I was up at Drastic Measures in Wadena and I was there for deer opener. And I was expecting a dramatically different scene. And what I got was some people that were in town for the opener, some locals. And we had the same conversations up there that we would have had if we had been at Venn Brewing, which is the closest one to my house. It's hmm. cool. It's good. All right, let's get to the next question. Here's Tracy Davis. As you think about the people you interviewed in the industry, who offered an insight that you still remember today? Mm. Caitlin? I mean, that, that, that brings me back to the Beer and Life blogging days, too. I think um, the one that I reflect on a lot after interviewing him was Austin at Hammerheart Brewing. Um, and they're featured in the book. And I, he has just a really amazing story of how he came into craft beer and his experience with music and craft beer and uh, like his political stance. I think that so much of a person's ethos can show up in their tap room. So Hammerheart is, I have their beer in my fridge. I wish I had it with me to show you. Um, they do lots of like smoked beers and, and they have one technique where they um, like scream at the yeast as it's fermenting. Uh, and everything he told me while I was talking with him was just, it, it, it didn't feel like you were just talking about beer necessarily. It was talking about like perspectives on life and on government and the way that people should treat each other. And I mean, would you get that in interviewing people about their work in any other industry? And uh, I just got her in minor lakes. Oh, you got it. It's kind of this Lord of the Rings type place, right? <laughs> yes. And you will see a Lord of the Rings reference in the book. So excellent. excellent. Very on brand. That That is an example of fantastic branding right there. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Yeah, I do think like part of the excitement of our state's culture is that you can get extreme quality. You look at like Lupuline, which I think is like a really high quality uh, craft brewer, and you get a hammerhead. You get places out of the metro uh, that will bring a beer to market, and you're like, damn, like that is really good and really consistent. It's kind of, there's something democratic about the process, not politically, small d democratic, <laughs> that quality can rise up, right? Like there are places that have big marketing or places that have investors or money behind them. But often I would say like in the craft brewing industry, quality uh, does rise up. And sometimes that's a big guy and sometimes that's a small guy. And I think it's interesting. I haven't actually run the numbers on it because I just had the idea, but I think the craft brewers are pretty well spread out through Minnesota's eight congressional districts. If you think about it, there's a lot of them everywhere. Yeah. Let's get to another question from our Facebook uh, group. Nathan starts asking about the next phase of taproom and craft brewing evolution. Uh, is it perhaps speculation on special specialization or niche beer making taproom specializing in certain styles? So like we've seen a little of that, right? Like Uda Pills that does like a very German style, La Donia doing kind of a Mexican beer style, uh, which I would put La Donia on one of my favorite tap rooms to visit. Are we growing to be a broader experimental barrel culture in craft room making? Is this what we're seeing uh, coming forward? More, more aging, more barrels beyond the kind of annual barrel increase? Or are we going to see more of an annual, you know, a year-round barrel beer bit? Thanks, Nathan, for the question, Caitlin. Yeah, Nathan, that's a really fantastic question, and I think a lot of it depends on the market more than the interest level. So you might have 
two percent of the beer drinking population that's really into you know barrel fermented sours but is that enough to justify buying a half a million dollar brew house perhaps not so there's the question of feasibility i think is a really big part of that um which is not fun or like a very sexy answer necessarily but you see like people like indeed has their wooden soul program that um you know is still chugging along but i don't think has necessarily exploded the way that people who love barrel programs would have liked to see or you have lupulin started their scribbled lines brewing um and they have so many barrels it will even if you don't think barrels are all that cool, like your jaw will drop. It's fantastic. So established breweries are branching out into having more of a barrel program. Portage has a barrel program. Um, Forager, Austin joked with me that he's always like finding new places in the restaurant to sneak barrels into and he'll do it <laughs> one day after any leaves. Um, and, and, you know, and they're beautiful so they can fill out a space really nicely, which is great. But I don't think that you're, probably going to see a lot of breweries starting with exclusively niche products because usually the goal of a tap room or the goal of a brewery is to bring as many people as possible together to have a little bit more of a something for everyone. I guess with barrel theory, you are seeing really intense IPA and barrel program combined. So that would be an example of someone who succeeded with that. And they have a lot of hype around them, which is fantastic. And their brewers came from really well-established places as compared to, you know, home brewers attempting to go commercial. So that works in their favor, but I think those will be a little bit fewer and further between. I think you're more going to see neighborhood tap rooms, neighborhood breweries than you are niche ones. Yeah, I, th I think you might find a few more of the specialty ones in the Twin Cities where you can find a couple hundred people that will like any darn style you can put together. But if you're setting up in greater Minnesota, or if you're setting up in a distant burb and you want to get that party of six or eight people when we're allowed to do that again, you know, you want to make sure that you've got a beer that everybody in that group is going to like, and you don't want to have to turn, you know, a group to walk out because the, birthday boy or girl only likes pilsners and all they've got here are double ipas let's do let's pop one more question up if we can here's uh rihanna what is the hope you have for the craft brewing industry in minnesota in the next five to ten years oh i love that question looking forward what are you thinking hi rihanna um i gosh what i would love to see is uh, more education type programs coming from local breweries. So helping teach the general public about the nuances of the yeast you use, because, you know, you can only put so much in an Instagram caption and hope that people in the algorithm will like it, you know, to be able to do like off flavor testing experiences at a brewery, um, which, you know, it takes a certain amount of confidence as a brewery to train people to be more discerning with your own beers, but. Um, by flaw. Right. I, I, I do think that there's a lot of opportunity there. And then I definitely think there's a lot of opportunity to like diversify this place where there's just so many dang white people and, you know, do what you will, like inviting folks to come drink with you. But when the owners are white and the brewers are white, there's only so much that can be done. Um, so I think there's a lot of room for growth in that space. And that's just going to take some really strong leadership and um, breweries turning to people who know more than them. The Brewers Association has um, brought on, I can't remember her title, but Dr. J, I think she's their chief diversity officer, but I might be remembering that incorrectly. Um, and that was fairly recent. So she's been, you know, doing some work with like the national level of craft beer, um, which is good. And I think we just need to start seeing that more at the state and local levels as well. Nice. That wasn't a very like sexy beer answer. I want to see more people love Vienna lagers as well. <laughs> good call. Um, in my I case, have... I'm look sure, looking for some of the same diversity, but I think I'm also 
looking for socioeconomic diversity because I think one of the limiting factors for craft beer right now is the price point. Whether you're in your local liquor store or you're at the tap room, if you're used to paying two bucks for a beer and the even the Pilsner is five or six bucks, I think that can be you know a little bit of sticker shock for people. But I think one, as Caitlin said, if we do the education necessary, that you're going to be able to have a, a couple of beers for your ten dollars that are really remember really memorable as opposed to spending that same ten dollars on ten beers and not remembering anything yeah yeah i think we've seen a bit of a movement into like the every man every woman boat beer session beer this is the beer for the miller light drinker for someone who wants to support local and i think the jury's out on that right like we don't know if is there enough of a market for people who want to do the local thing, uh, but wants a beer that tastes like what they mostly drink? I think we'll see. I guess we don't know, right? We really don't. Yeah, that's that's true. And if we keep trying to find, if there's a tough line that brewers have to walk that I want to make the beer I want to make, I want to make the beer that I think will sell, but I'd also like to do some education, get people drinking something else. So th there's those three things that are all tugging at each other, but I think that also gets us the creativity as the brewers and the beer drinking public try and reconcile that. Well, Doug and Caitlin, I want to thank you guys so much. The book is called Pints North. You can get it at the Minnesota Historical Society. Hey, we're all... We're doing a good job selling the book, right? I hope so. Uh, I think you guys are really going to enjoy it. Caitlin, I just congratulate you. Like, I learned so much reading this book, and I've kind of been here and been following this. But uh, you taught me quite a bit, and I'm very grateful uh, for you and your work on that. And I, I want to just kind of – this is your, your book release party, so I want to give you uh, the chance to have the final word and say whatever you like about it. Uh, it's got to be pretty cool to see your own, to see your name on a book, right? Like that's pretty sweet. Yes, it's, it's absolutely wild. The college English major in me is very impressed with my ability to use my degree. Um, all I can say is, right now, you know, your local service industry is facing a really long few weeks and a long. It's been a really long year. So go out and please, please, please support local if you are blessed enough to have not been economically impacted by this pandemic, buy this book from a local independent bookseller, pair it with a crowler and a t-shirt from your favorite brewery that you wanna teach someone about. And it makes a really great Christmas present that way. Um, go out and buy gift cards, go out and get a crowler and support local in every way you can. Grab your Thanksgiving meal out to eat. It's, you know, we're not gonna be doing those same big gatherings that we normally do. So go support a restaurant, um, go support a food truck. It makes a huge difference. Thank you, everyone. Really good. Congratulations, Caitlin. Thank you so much. Caitlin didn't even like really plug her own brewery where she works. So let's cheers to inbound. Cheers, guys. Uh, label facing. Very hard in a mirror. <laughs> Get that label facing, right? But cheers to inbound and congratulations on the book. This was really fun. I hope. Uh, everybody in the Facebook chat enjoyed it as much as I think the three of us did. So congratulations and thanks for joining us here. Go get the book, Pine Smoke North, Minnesota's Craft Beer Culture.